Hi there, I'm Leanne Vanderputten, mother of 11, grandmother of 42 and counting, from Finer Femininity, where I share with you tidbits of old-fashioned goodness and wholesomeness to help us on the path to being joyful, traditional, feminine Catholic women. Today our article is from the Catholic Family Handbook by Father George Kelly, and it is called, What is a True Christian Catholic Family? We probably can best appreciate the characteristics of a genuine God-fearing family by picturing it in operation in a representative home. As Richard Cardinal Cushing of Boston has inspiringly described it, quote, the worthy Christian home finds a true Christian family abiding therein and growing in love and care for one another. This home is not constructed in prefabricated fashion in a few weeks or a few years, for it is not purely material. Indeed, its true character is achieved not through plaster and paint and sanitary plumbing, but through love and sweat and tears. It is a framework trimmed with remembered moments of joy cemented by hours of suffering. It is a reflection of the personalities of those who dwell therein, an expression of their likes and dislikes. The true Christian home is an altar of sacrifice and a theater of comedies and drama. It is a place of work and a haven of rest." End quote. If yours is a true Christian home, it is like a little church where the family daily joins together in beautiful devotions. The family rosary, family night prayers, and the act of consecration to the Sacred Heart. Life is viewed as Christ would have us view it. There is great trust and confidence in His providence. Love, tenderness, and forgiveness you find there, but also a high standard of moral living, obedience, and discipline. Parents and children, whether they be rich or poor, share generously with each other, go without things if necessary, and bear trials and sufferings in patience. It is a little school where your children learn to live and love as dignified human beings, to work for the good of others, and to serve their fellow man without thought of monetary gain. It is a little recreation center where the family relaxes in peace from outside woes and work. Playing together helps children and parents reconcile differences and adjust to each other's needs and builds up the affectionate ties that last a lifetime. Most of us remember the starring roles we had at one time or another in our own homemade theater. It is the humorous incidents of the family that help develop pleasant and outgoing personalities. The good fun involving mother and dad and all the boys and girls which the uncrowded modern household misses. You can best live up to this picture of true family life if you keep as your ideal the life led by the Holy Family at Nazareth. For there, as Cardinal Cushing goes on to say, quote, one beheld simplicity and purity of conduct, perfect agreement and unbroken harmony, mutual respect and love not of the false and fleeting kind, but that which found both its life and its charm in devotedness of service. At Nazareth, patient industry provided what was required for food and raiment. There was contentment with little, and a concentration on the diminishing of the number of wants, rather than on the multiplication of sources of wealth. Better than all else, at Nazareth, there was found that supreme peace of mind and gladness of soul which never fails to accompany the possession of a tranquil conscience. At Nazareth, one could witness a continuous series of examples of goodness, of modesty, of humility, of hard-working endurance, of kindness to others, of diligence in the small duties of daily life." End quote. You can imitate this model of the Holy Family only if you set out to make every member of your family more concerned about God and the things of God than about the things of this world. You must live in the awareness that all that is done is done in the presence of God and that genuine happiness results only when we conform to His will. The Triangle of God, Parents and Child 
It cannot be stressed too often that you can leave a heritage of good for centuries simply by leading a holy life as a parent. For example, if you have six children, it is possible that within your lifetime you will have 25 or 30 grandchildren. They, in turn, may have more than 100 children. And within a century, perhaps 1,000 lives will reflect your influence to some extent. If you have been a good parent, thanks to you, they may be good Christians, your advocates in heaven. If you are a bad example, you may leave a large number of evildoers as your contribution to God and humanity. As the Catholic bishops of the United States pointed out in 1950 in their memorable formal statement, quote, the child, citizen of two worlds, the first requirement of good Catholic family life is that the children must know God. However, as the bishops emphasized, there is a vast difference between knowing about God and knowing God. The difference is made by personal experience. It is not enough that the child be given the necessary truths about God. They ought to be given in such a way that he will assimilate them and make them a part of himself. God must become as real to him as his own father and mother. God must not remain an abstraction. If he does, he will not be loved. And if he is not loved, then all the child's knowledge about him will be sterile. Where love is, there too is service. If you love me, keep my commandments. That is Christ's test, and it must be applied to the child. He should be brought to see God's commandments and precepts as guideposts, which give an unerring direction to his steps. In this work, the church, the family, and the school all have a part to play. End quote. How can you teach your child to know God? First, by inspiring him to love and serve God by your own daily actions. He will be quick to imitate what he sees and hears at home. If good example is not forthcoming, he will become confused by the contradiction between what you teach and what you practice. His confusion will be compounded when he goes to a school where religion is taught. There he will learn to reverence the name of God but at home he may hear God's name used irreverently in petulance and anger. At school he will learn to get along with his fellow pupils, but at home he may be allowed to offend and wrangle with his brothers and sisters. At school he will be taught strict precepts of honesty and justice, while at home he may hear boasts of sharp business practices and clever evasions of truth. Disturbed by these contradictions and torn by conflicting loyalties to home and school, he will lose confidence in his parents or teachers or both. Only two courses are open to your child. He will be either God-centered or self-centered. Every young child seeks to satisfy every selfish whim. Training yours to consider God and others before he acts is one of the most challenging tasks you face. Here is where you can draw on the life of Christ. If you teach your child to deny his selfish whims in imitation of the obedient and patient Savior, he will not only have a supernatural motive for his actions, but God will have a central place in his affections. Only then can he grow up to his full spiritual stature. You can find joy in your children. While you should never forget that you are your children's foremost teacher and the most important influence they will ever know, your family life will lose its true perspective if you overemphasize the sacrifices you must make to educate them. For your joy in your children should outweigh by far any disadvantages they may cause. In them you will find your own happiness. Your children give dimension to your love as a couple. Conjugal love, which can be selfish and isolated, takes a great stride with the birth of a baby. Many young mothers have said, John and I did not really know what our love could grow to be until we held successive children in our arms. The greatest aid to your own maturity as human beings is the rearing of your children. St. John Chrysostom remarked, quote, Can there be a more responsible task than to mold the human spirit 
or form the morals of young people. I consider that man greater than any painter or sculptor who neglects not the molding of the souls of young people." End quote. In your children, you will rediscover your own youth. Their growth process will rekindle your own sense of wonder and enthusiasm. Johnny asks, Dad, why is the sky blue? And Dad, who hadn't cared, takes a new and longer look. What have you to show for having lived, if not your children? At 40 or 50 years of age, an adult generally reaches the limits of income and social standing. Yet parents continue to grow with their sense of fulfillment in the achievements of their children. And as if these satisfactions were not enough, parents through their offspring have a grand opportunity to spread the faith. They are real missionaries in their own home. They can say at the end of their lives, as Christ said of his apostles, Those whom thou hast given me, I guarded, and not one of them perish. John seventeen twelve. There is no doubt that genuine Catholic family life is among the best family life to be found in the United States. For Catholic married couples are one of the few large groups in the country who have consistently sacrificed themselves to have more children, and the large numbers of their children who, properly trained, have left Catholic homes to take up responsible roles in the armed services, corporate eco economic life, the labor movement, and the public offices of government reflect credit on those parents and on the church. In the Catholic home there is that modern rarity, fidelity between husband and wife. There is great reverence for parents by the children, great protection of weaker members by the stronger, and a great awareness of the dignity and rights of every member of the family. The Catholic woman has attained a height of respect and authority which cannot be found anywhere else, and the chief factor in her improvement has been the Church's teaching on chastity, conjugal equality, the sacredness of motherhood, and the supernatural end of the family, in imitation of the Holy Family of Nazareth. But even as we uphold the Catholic woman as wife and mother, we also uphold the preeminent place of the husband and father in the home. You must not forget that the vigor of your Catholicism rests on the stability and goodness of your family life. Of course, the Church knows better than anyone else that in proclaiming Catholic family ideals, she is dealing with human weakness and the tendency to selfishness and sin. Like a good mother, she also forgives and embraces those who momentarily betray those ideals. But, unlike others, she will never admit that those weaknesses diminish or vitiate God's place for fathers and mothers, or call sin virtue, or pretend that weakness is strength. The reward for all your efforts is the call on Christ on Judgment Day. Come, ye blessed of my Father. Finer Femininity Quote for the Day the difference between this child and that one is often largely a matter of what he saw in and heard from his parents. His religious response, his sense of honesty, his ability to play with other children and be unselfish toward them, his attitude toward books, his appreciation of the beautiful, his sense of what is right and what is wrong, his quick apprehending of the charming and noble, his ready reaction to music that is good, his approval of heroism and his rejection of evil and cheapness. All these things need to be established in the child's mind by the parents, who alone can deeply and strong-rootedly establish them. And that was by Father Daniel A. Lord in 1950s. Thank you for tuning in today. Come and visit me at my Finer Femininity website. I have a Facebook page too where I share with you inspirations of all kinds. I also have lots of beautiful handcrafted items in my Meadows of Grace shop. Look for those links in the description below. May God bless you and Our Lady cover you with her mantle. Saint Anne, pray for us.